Welcome back to the 150K Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Graham, where we help take your dreams to six figures and beyond. Today, I have with me special guest, Katie Richardson, who I actually met through two of my really good friends, George Bryant and Brian Bogart. I actually just did, I don't know if it was a course, training, or whatever, but a week of the error of you, which was just amazing. But Katie, for people that don't know you or maybe haven't heard your story, tell us a little bit about yourself and um, your background and how you are now helping CEOs and other people just like level up. Yeah, George, or sorry, not George, Joe. So good <laughs> no to be here. That's Thank a compliment you for having to me. On me. This show. <laughs> You're I'm really excited to be here. And I am, I'm an entrepreneur. I've built a multi-million dollar international business. I now coach CEOs, entrepreneurs inside of their business. And I think the thing that would be really relevant to everybody who's listening to us right now is I'm kind of a, an unusual entrepreneur in the sense that when I got started, I just, I really loved helping people. And it turns out entrepreneurship is an incredible vehicle to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I started building a business and was having kids at the same time. And as I was building this business and it was really taking off, I started to see how it potentially could destroy me, destroy my relationship with my kids, destroy my relationship with my husband, the man that I was madly in love with. And it scared me because it was so time demanding specifically business was. And I started to wonder if it was possible to build a business that strengthened my marriage and helped me be present with my kids and deepen my relationship with God. That kind of became the quest that I was on. And ultimately, I, I still am on that quest, but I feel like I've answered a lot of those questions and I've built a life and systems and processes to support me in doing that. And that's what I do today is help people build a significant business that is serving people all around the world and do it in a way where you're loving your life and you are able to be present with your family, able to live the life that you've always dreamed of. And, you know, for me, Joe, that looks like I live in Puerto Rico and we live on right on the beach and my kids are homeschooling and we live a very adventurous life and the business supports us in doing that, right? It's, it's there to be that vehicle in living the life that we want and we dream of. And I'm really fortunate to be doing something that I didn't know I would want to do and being a business coach and really helping serve people on a really high level. And ultimately it's the same, same thing, right? In the beginning, I built a physical products company that was serving people through my physical products. Mm -hmm. And today I'm helping and serving CEOs through my coaching, my teaching, my training, my mindset teaching, um, helping them understand business in a whole new way. So I'm loving it. And that's who I am. And this is what got me here. And, and I love that. And you, you hit on some key things that I really like. First and foremost, you had a heart to serve people. And in today's day and age, and you and I both know this, a lot of times businesses and entrepreneurs aren't thinking that way. So that distinguishes you. Secondly, though, and I think this is huge. How did you manage to start a business, sell a business, and then become a coach and still be happily married, still have the fun time with the kids, still get to live the life of your dreams, because I think that's what we really all want to do. We want to, you know, build our business, help people, but we don't want to leave our friends and family behind. So how, how do you, mm. how did that happen? You know, I wish I could say that I had this grand plan all architected out when I started my journey. And that I just followed that plan step by step. But the truth is, even if I did have that plan, life throws us curveballs. And what we think we can see and understand from where we are doesn't actually turn out to be reality. And my approach has been a little bit different. I am a planner. I do strategize. But it's a much more purpose-driven plan. And so for me, my goal and my North Star for a long time has been to become the woman that God created me to be. And business was a vehicle to do that. So whether or not that was in the physical product space for a time, that's what it looked like. And then there was a point when it was time for me to get out of that vehicle. And I had done a great job with that vehicle and I had learned a lot. 
And it was time for me to get into a new vehicle that was going to stretch me in new ways, that was going to help me develop skills and abilities that I wasn't developing inside of the physical products company. Mm -hmm. And so I'm still moving towards that same target of developing myself, shining my light into the world and helping others to do the very same thing. And I'm just getting in and out of different vehicles. So, but to, to be really honest, shifting from being in the physical product world, having a 20,000 square foot warehouse, a team of about 15 employees, and in a sense, even kind of hiding behind products, mm -hmm. making that shift into coaching was excruciating. <laughs> it was not easy. <laughs> nope. It was, it was very scary and extremely difficult. So the short answer is I did it by taking one step at a time. And each step felt like I was on the edge of a cliff and I had to jump and it was all or nothing. And I had to go all in, or I was going to miss the target. That's what it felt like. And there was a lot of doubt and I always forget what this is called. Not identity fraud, false. What is it? I always forget what it's called. Imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. Thank you. Okay, cool. I was just, I was thinking identity theft. No, it's not that. <laughs> it's not that. Um, totally had imposter syndrome because sure, I had built my business to be significant and get all of this attention and awards and exiting that company successfully. But there was totally, it was unexpected. Doubt showed up and it was like, well, yeah, you did that for yourself, but who are you to think that you can help somebody else do that in their business? Yeah. And that was scary. And continually, the thing that helped me move past that, and it was, I would say like 18 months of that, Joe, that I was in that wrestle and that battle. And as I would face that battle, whether it was crying in the shower or getting on the phone with a client and suddenly having the fear of, oh my gosh, am I really who I, I say I am? And are they going to find out I'm not as awesome as they think I am? Like whenever I was facing that doubt continually, I had to go back to my decision. And this is, this is a powerful principle that I would invite everybody who's listening to pay attention to. I had to go back to the choice. And it was, am I doing this because I have to? Am I doing this because God's making me? Uh, and there were times when that's, that was my intention. And I had, mm -hmm. to, I had to go back to it and I had to correct it. It was, I'm doing this because I'm choosing it because I want it, even though I'm scared. Yep. It terrifies me. I don't know what the outcome's going to be. And if I would go back to that place of choosing it, suddenly I was empowered again and I could move through the doubt and the fear and really incredible things would open up for me. So um, that would be something that anybody who's listening, if you're at that fork in the road and you're trying to make decisions, make the decision and move forward. And when you, when the fear and the doubt shows up, remember that you made a decision, you made a choice and lean on that. And it'll help you move through the doubt and the fear. Yeah, no, and, and I love that. So let's dig into this a little bit more because I think a lot of people, and I know I deal with it, that whole imposter syndrome. So like in sales, I'm a master at sales. I've done it. I can do it in a bunch of different businesses. But then when you go to actually train or impart or help other people with it, I, I hear that same voice. Well, why are they going to listen to you? Why would that work? Because in my mind, certain things I do are simple and easy, but transferring that to someone else is kind of hard at times. So what I heard you say, and I'm going to repeat it is, you made the choice to be the coach. You made the choice to help and impact people. So that's your foundation to go back to when that voice hits you. What other, is that like the only thing you do? Is there other things that you do to kind of reinforce like where you're at with getting mm -hmm. past yourself for lack of better terms? Well, I love that we're actually talking about sales specifically because it turns out, Joe, I'm really, really good at sales. Mm -hmm. But the funny thing is, I wasn't in the beginning because I hate sales and I hadn't been trained in it. And it was really uncomfortable to ask for somebody's credit card. Um, like there was so much about it that was just had me want to curl up in a ball and disappear. Mm -hmm. But when I realized that I needed to get out of the game of trying to get someone to buy my thing yep. and get into the game of solving problems for people, then I actually got really, really good at it. And when you can make that shift of, instead of being in conversation with somebody and trying to get them to buy my thing, if I would show up as a problem solver and trying to help people find solutions, then I all of a sudden was asking the right questions. Um, and it didn't take long for them to be asking me like, well, how can I order this from you? Right? Like mm -hmm. I just had to get out of the way. 
And so when I learned that sales was about helping people get really clear on what their problem is and help them identify the solution, maybe mine is the solution they want and need. Maybe it's not. But if you can show up in that way, it will empower you in negotiations. It will empower you on like really big sales, right? Yes, 100%. So that, that has been a tool that I've used. It, it goes back to that desire to serve people. Mm -hmm. right? I'm, I'm asking questions. I'm listening. What's, what's the actual problem? Is there something that they're not saying that might be the gap and the reason why they're not finding that solution? And if I can articulate that, maybe that will help them find the solution, whether or not it's me again, or yeah. my product. Well, it, and it's funny because like literally what you just said is how I train sales now, because I've never yeah. looked at it as getting something from them was always helping them. Because when I first started sales, I had the same thought, same process. I'm like, well, I don't want to take advantage of people. I grew up in the Midwest. Sales are bad. Yes. Sales are icky. And I changed yeah. it to just helping people solve problems. And I refer people away if I can't help them. And Love once it. I did that, it just started to increase like crazy. So yeah, that yeah. when you said that, I was just like, that's what I do. That's kind of, it, it kind of just validated that whole thought process with it. So yeah. With that in mind, though, and just moving forward with business and, and balance and life and all, how do you still, do you time block? How do you, how do you structure your day? Because I know that you're going to be pulled like 19 different ways. Entrepreneurs always are. Yeah. So over the years, I mean, I've been an entrepreneur for about 18 years. And over the years, this time blocking has shifted and changed. In the beginning, there was no time block. It was like everything for the business at all costs. And that's where I was burning out. I was frustrated. I didn't have patience for my kids. Um, I was anxious a lot of the time because I didn't have my day organized. And so there was just so much going on in my head and in my heart. And I was just in an internal battle. And the way that I started to de develop a kind of daily routine, I'll tell you this story. Um, it was when my kids were really, really young. And I would stay up really late to work because it was kind of the only time I could get time to myself. And so in the morning I would kind of sleep in, I was just tired. And there was this one morning where my son comes into the room and he's got his empty bottle that he'd gone to bed with the night before. And he's banging me in the forehead while I'm still in bed saying more milk, mommy, more milk. Uh, and yep. I would, you know, slide out of bed. I was annoyed with him. I was just tired. I would shuffle into the kitchen. I would fill the bottle up with milk again. I would hand it to him like, here you go. And then I would slip back into bed. Only I couldn't go back to bed. And I was just, I was just mad. Mm -hmm. And I would notice on days where I woke up like that, that by 10 AM, my patience was gone and mm -hmm. mean mommy was in the driver's seat. <laughs> and I, I just, I watched myself do this. And I was like, this is not who I want to be. This is not how I want to be with my kids. I'm irritated with them. I don't have any patience for them. And it's because I'm not taking care of myself. And so I started to realize the value of self-care and a daily routine. And after many mornings like this with the milk bottle of the forehead, there was this morning where I woke up and he hadn't come in yet, Joe. And I was like, I'm getting out of here. And I slipped out of the house and I was like, I guess I'm going to become a runner. <laughs> I tried running <laughs> and I swear I got like 10 steps into it. And I was like, yeah, this, this is not working, but at least I'll walk. I'll, yeah, I'll walk. walk. I'll walk. That's where I was. That's where I was. Honestly, I'd had three kids. My body was not super fit and running. It just, my, there was no rhythm to it for me. And uh, so I started by walking and I would go walking in the mornings. And I noticed that when I took that time to go walking, I had more patience and that I was more present with my kids. And then I was more focused at work. And so that's where I started. It started to spill out into consistently saying prayer, consistently reading scripture, making better eating choices. But it was all around really taking care of my needs, of my, my mind, my heart, my body, taking care of those needs and developing practices over years, mm -hmm. years. It took me years to develop all of these practices. And now today, what does it look like? I wake up at six. I don't have to wake up as early as I used to. I used to wake up at five. Yeah. Um, today, my kids are older. I wake up at six and from six till eight, I'm doing prayer, scripture study, meditation. I'm going to the gym. I'm going for a walk. I'm journaling. I'm doing those things that I need to do to really feel centered and grounded and not in reaction mode. Mm -hmm. And then eight to nine, I'm doing breakfast with the kids, cleaning up, organizing, 
And then usually my calls start at nine and then I'm done with work by about two. And nice. then from, from two till the evening, it's, you know, going to play in the, the waves of the ocean with the kids or going on some adventure, maybe just crafting at the kitchen table, um, doing stuff together as a family, and then going to bed at a reasonable hour. And that's not glamorous, but like even my day, I've got a 10 a.m. meeting with my team every day, and it's just a quick, short meeting. We make sure we're on target for everything. Um, I have my coaching calls. I have a podcast as well. So like those are on specific days. Yep. So it's about really organizing my life so that I could be focused. I can be centered. I can be really present in my work and serve my customers and my clients at a really high level and Which do I it love. in a way that's sustainable, right? For, for me and my family. Yeah, no, it, well, that's perfect. You're building a life by design. You're building it to yes. what you want it to be. And for the people that are just starting out right now, I want to make sure you heard what she said. Start out small, make the little changes and just yes. build on them. It wasn't a, I'm going to do 85 new things in the morning and have a different morning routine. You're going to fail. But if you do a little bit yes. each day, maybe go for the walk, like you mentioned, or meditate, pray, whatever that is for you and start building from there because yeah, you have to be hundred percent present with your clients. They'll know, especially in today's day and age. And, and I know you, you think this way, but I think a lot of times we get so busy trying to do the latest, newest thing instead of just relating and connecting with our clients and helping them. Yes. Yes. And when we just yes. focus on them, it's easy. So that like that whole thought process just just hit my head there again so we have the daily practice you teach or you do stuff with your clients you spend time with the family you get in the ocean which is awesome um what other things are we missing here and like because I like you've been a CEO for a while so there's different things that maybe you've experienced that I've not or my listeners have not what other things mm -hmm. should we be doing to improve ourselves like do you listen to other people's podcasts do you read books or are you more just focused on self-care and development. How do you handle that? A skill that anybody, if they develop, will benefit their business and their life is the ability to navigate your mind and your thoughts. And the way that you can do that is by getting out of your head. So journaling. And it's something that I was at a critical point where I was trying to decide if I was going to take my company to the next level or sell it and go do something else. And I was at that fork in the road, Joe, for almost two years. And I didn't know what was the right answer, right? I didn't know what was the right thing for me to do. And I was really terrified that I was going to make the wrong choice and not discover it until, you know, three, five years later and be like, oh man, that was a really dumb decision that I made five years ago. And now I can't do anything about it. I was, I was terrified of that regret. And the thing that I started doing because it, I just had so much going on in my mind and there was more than being at a fork in the road where I could go down road one or road two, it felt like there were 17 roads I could go down and it was just, <laughs> yeah. it was really overwhelming. And so the way that I began to navigate it was journaling and getting out of my head and saying, okay, well, one potential scenario is this. And I would kind of build out that scenario and I would ask myself, is that what I want? Is that like, no, I don't have all of the answers of exactly what it's going to look like if I go down that road, but is that exciting to me? Does that light me up? Is that a direction that I even want to go down? Maybe I could go down that road, but do I want to live that life? Yeah. And yeah. so journaling is a really powerful tool that anybody can do. And this is what I invite my clients to do is, is journal so that you can start to understand and navigate all of those thoughts that are going through your head. So when you're saying journaling and all, because I've heard many different ways of doing it, is it just mm -hmm. where, like, I've heard somebody say, you get up in the morning, you just write three pages of whatever. Then other people are like, hey, you journal and you have a set purpose and a plan with it. Then there are people like, they just journal the feelings. Is there a set way to do it or do you do all of that? That's a good question. I'm a product designer mm -hmm. by origin. And, and so I see myself very much as a creative creator. And um, I don't like rules. And I, <laughs> I'm like, I want to, I want to change things as soon as, as soon as people think they know where, what I'm doing, I'm, I'm going to change it. So, I mean, I have lots of different routines. I have gratitude practices that I do where I write out the things that I'm grateful for. It's really easy to develop a strong negative voice. And I think, especially anybody who is an entrepreneur, we have a strong internal critic. Mm -hmm. And so we need to balance that with 
gratitude and appreciation for where we are. And that might seem counterintuitive and we might think, well, in order to get to where I want to go, I need to be really dissatisfied with where I am. And actually the opposite is true. You need to understand how that thing that you want that's in the future, you need to find evidences that it's already here now and start feeling the gratitude of that. Um, so that's one of my journaling practices. Another is developing I am statements mm -hmm. and that imposter syndrome can make us believe all these things that I am not. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not actually as successful as they think I am, or um, I, I'm not as awesome as they think I am, whatever it is, I don't have the authority, right? And so we can begin to create ourselves in a, in a present tense version of that future self that we want to create through I am statements. Mm -hmm. And one example of that is as I was in this physical products business, I naturally had a lot of people coming to me saying, you know, you've built this multi-million dollar international business and you're happy and you have four kids and you're really grounded. Like what the heck are you doing that? I'm not because <laughs> yeah, they yeah. were feeling the opposite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, as I was doing that, there were different opportunities that were coming my way to, to take on clients and to speak and speaking and specifically, it was really intimidating for me. I felt unqualified. I felt not eloquent enough. I didn't feel as smart as everybody else in the room. So why should I be on the stage? And yet these opportunities were coming to me. And honestly, there was something about them that I, I did like, and I wanted to be really good at it. I think that's the important thing. I wanted to be a good speaker. Mm -hmm. So I had to start taking on that identity. And the more I kept saying, I'm not a speaker, the more I was just pushing it away. And so yep. I had to flip that and start saying, I am a speaker. And so um, making these I am statements is also a really good journaling practice. Another thing that I do is when I see myself getting in my own way and that I'm in a place of fear or doubt, what I'll do is I start journaling and I start writing out all of the fears that I'm running and hiding from. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a way for me to confront them and actually look at them. And what's so wild is we can be really afraid of something inside of our head, but as soon as you define it actually and get it out on paper, you immediately begin to diminish it. And it, it often doesn't take long once you've written it out to really be like, oh, that's what I was afraid of? Well, that's not actually an issue because of X, Y, and Z. Or if that even did happen, the way that I would handle it is with this, right? right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes something can seem so terrifying and scary when it's mostly just invisible in our head. And if you just get it out of your head and you write it on paper, you actually can see it's not something to be so afraid of. So I would say those are kind of the top three things that I do when I'm journaling. No, and I love that. And it's kind of funny because a friend of mine had challenged me before I took the air review. You were talking about the I am statements to write out yeah. like 10 I am statements and I put it on my sales board. So when I'm sitting at my desk, I see it and I write it out because I can get in my own head. Um, but I love that whole aspect of you were talking about saying it out loud sometimes would take away the aspect of it. So if you're feeling unworthy, mm -hmm. then you just say, I am worthy. Or if you're feeling like, I can't do this. Like, like you said, I want to be a speaker or I am a speaker. I even, I almost, even my mind tried to do it differently that way, but I had to fix it. And I think it's that mm -hmm. subconscious programming that we have to mm -hmm. start doing and listening. And you mentioned something else and you've said, it's been through the whole thread and I love this, but it feels like your faith is a huge factor for you in life. Like that's Huge. something that really drives you, which is great. Mm -hmm. I'm a Christian as well. I have friends of different faiths, but like faith, I think matters. It matters on your worldview and how you look at life. If you don't mind, tell us a little bit more about how your faith yeah. has shaped and kind of gotten you to this point. Totally. There's a really personal and sacred experience that I can share that helps you understand my perspective and how and why I approach business in this way. When I was building my business, like I said, it was with really young kids and it was through tremendous sacrifice. I didn't have investors in the beginning. I didn't have savings. I was literally building it from zero. And it was really, really hard. And it included making sacrifices like grinding wheat and making four loaves of bread a week to feed my family because we were we we just didn't have a grocery budget. And so I was living on food storage. I got really good at making rice and beans and just making really healthy, but simple meals. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And, you know, when you sacrifice at that kind of a level for a couple of years, it's, it's hard and it's painful. And after sacrificing at this level, the business started to take off. And when it took off, it really took off Joe. And mm -hmm. within one year of revenue, we'd done over a million dollars and that's wholesale. So retail, we generated over $2 million globally. Nice. And that was like nuts, right? Yeah, definitely nuts. And as the rocket ship is taking off, we had some investors come in and they helped us um, with cash flow. Cause when you're purchasing goods overseas, you've got to float inventory for like six months. And, mm -hmm. and so they saw all of our purchase orders and they helped us to start to scale. And um, within that first year of things starting to take off, they were like, this is incredible. Um, we, we should raise some more money and let's raise a million dollars. We can get a $10 million valuation. You'll have cash in the bank in two weeks. And so we were right at this point where the money was supposed to come in and we were we had to go to Taiwan. There's so much to this story. <laughs> Probably giving you way too it. many. No, it's details. good. It's good. Keep going. We're in Taiwan, living, literally making noodles on a hot plate in our apartment, hoping mm -hmm. someday that more money is going to come into the business bank account. Yeah. And I, I won't give you the whole backstory, but we get a call from these investors who are helping us raise the money. And they said, we're not raising the money. In fact, we want to see this company burn. And they wow. were like, you know, just like take, just leaving us to, to die and to pull the rug out from underneath us. And what was so devastating, Joe, is like personally, I had gone from believing I was invisible in the world um, through a lot of different stories we won't go into, but I felt so insignificant in my life. And for the first time, I felt like, gosh, I'm actually doing something that matters mm -hmm. and that like people are seeing me and this is exciting. And this, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm getting to put my talents out there and it's, it's making a difference in people's lives. And so not only were they burning the company, it felt like they were burning me mm -hmm. and my worth and my value. It was devastating. And I had gone on this journey and built this company ultimately because I felt like God wanted me to, like he kept putting opportunities in front of me and I was trusting him and he was showing me how to do it. And in this moment in Taiwan, it felt like I was being abandoned by him. Mm -hmm. It was devastating. It was devastating. It still gets me emotional. And um, I was just really confused. You know, why would he lead me to this point just to push me off a cliff? It didn't make any sense. And so as I'm in the despair and loneliness of all of this and in a 300 square foot tiny apartment in Taipei, Taiwan, in the financial district with three kids that I was homeschooling. <laughs> so I was trying to do all of these things and they're just like bouncing off the walls. And I'm worried somebody's going to split their head open on the windowsill. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like trying to figure all of this out. I'm trying to figure out what to say to the investors and I can't even think straight. Yeah. And so I am mad at God, but at the same time, I'm looking for his help and guidance mm -hmm. and I'm trying to pray to him and I don't even know what to pray for. And so I finally decided I was going to pray for peace because if I had peace, then I could think straight again. So I pray yeah. for peace. I opened the scriptures and sometime, Joe, I'm happy to share. It was, it was Isaiah, Isaiah 53. If you are somebody who loves God, go read Isaiah 53. And that verse, that chapter put everything into perspective for me. And it helped me realize that it wasn't about the business. Mm -hmm. I thought that, that God had me building this business because it was about the business and the products and the brand and that those things were important. And what he taught me in those verses is that the business was great, but it was just a vehicle. Yeah. And it was a vehicle for me to become the woman that he had designed and created me to be. A vehicle that was going to grow me and stretch me and give me opportunities to make decisions to lead and to be a light in this world. And if I need to get out of that vehicle, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Cause I'm okay. Show me how to go create another one. Mm -hmm. And so from that point on my intention still today is for me to become who he created me to be and coaching is an amazing business. I love it. I really help love helping CEOs 
thrive in their business and in their life. And it's all through that same lens that their business is a vehicle for them to become who God created them to be. And I can show them how to do that. It's life altering when you approach business and life in that way. And what's so wild is that is the secret to allowing your business to really thrive. I love that. First and foremost, thank you for sharing that. Like I, like I was feeling the emotion when you were telling the story and I like, I was picturing sitting in Taiwan, seeing you do the stuff in all, but yeah. So first and foremost, thank you for sharing that. Secondly, I agree with you hundred percent. And, and, and thirdly, I have been mad at God and still ask for help and you can still do that. I want to put that yeah. part out there because I think a lot of times people will get mad at God, but we won't ask. Or we'll be like yeah. stubborn. And in reality, we need to have the life that is designed for us, that we want to become. So yeah, thank you. And yeah, you're welcome. I feel like you pointed something out, but even though I was mad at him, I was willing to ask. And he invites us to ask him, but he can't really help us until we ask him, right? He's not going to force his, his ideas and his ways onto us. We have to ask for him. And I, I've come to believe that I think he even wants us in that wrestle because he can teach us so much if we're going to be engaged in that wrestle. So yeah, it, it's not comfortable to be upset at him. It's not comfortable to ask some of those difficult questions and be in that wrestle. But if we're willing to jump in the ring and being, be in that wrestle, he'll teach us really profound life altering things. Yeah. Well, and just because I think of it this way and I talk to God how I feel. So there has been times when I've swore and just I've been mad. I'm like, I'm just mad. Probably not the right thing to do, but that's just where I was. And there's been times mm -hmm. I've been grateful in life. And I think I think sometimes we put it in too much of a box. It has to be this way for God to move. No, God knows where you're yeah. at. He understands yeah. what you're doing. He knows where you were going to be. So if he knows where you're going to be, where you're at, what you're doing, just be authentic. Love it. And I think that comes down to another thing we can, we can touch base on. I don't want to go too much more on this because you just dropped such wisdom there. I don't know how to go up from here, but except for maybe let's talk a little bit about being authentic with our customers. Because mm -hmm. I think that is something that I, I know you definitely do. Um, but how do you stay non-transactional in a world that is trying to transaction, transaction to be transactional? How, how, mm -hmm. do you, how do you keep the focus on the customer? So there's like a principle that I want to show you. And then there's even a tactic that can, I can teach you. It's really important to check yourself and ask, what is my intention here? And if you can identify an intention that is coming from a place of integrity, that is representative of you and your values, then you can show up with your clients and sell them products within integrity because your intention and I, my intention is hopefully always to help and serve people. So, mm -hmm. but sometimes we have to check in with ourselves and be like, okay, why am I asking him these questions? Why am I reacting to him this way? Maybe my intention's off. Maybe I'm getting defensive because my intention was to sell this guy right. and he's not liking it. He's not having it. And my ego doesn't like it. And so I'm reacting to him. Mm -hmm. And if we can notice these things and shift our intention to helping people solve problems, which is the intention that I bring. If you can get clear on what that intention is, then it becomes really easy and effortless to sell people. And the kind of visual or tactic, if you will, to identify this is, you know, a business has to have revenue or it's not a business, Joe. Right. And so to have that revenue, you're going to have revenue targets, right? Mm -hmm. But I have found when it becomes about the money, I don't care. I'm not motivated. It doesn't excite me. And it gets me showing up needy and desperate and I get in my own way. Mm -hmm. So how can we have revenue targets, but not be motivated and driven by them? Do you know what a stereogram is? No. They are these really ugly posters. I was a child of the eighties. And if you mm -hmm. walked through the mall, actually, okay, now I know what they are. Then. I'm a child of the nineties. I just didn't know what they're called. Okay. Yeah. If you walked through the mall in the nineties, when I was like 13, if you walked through the mall, then you would see a kiosk with these really weird computer generated posters that were, had like repetitive patterns, but there wasn't really a picture on that poster. It was like, I think there's something there. And the, the thing with a stereogram is if you stare directly at the stereogram, 
it's going to just look ugly like it does. Mm -hmm. If you can look past the poster and yep. look through it, all of a sudden, something you didn't know was there pops up in this beautiful 3D image of maybe the pyramids of Egypt or a beautiful oasis along the beach will pop up. And if you, again, like you'll shift your focus. If you, you all of a sudden you see this 3D image and then you jump back to, to focusing at the poster and you're like, where is that beach yeah. scene? It's not on the poster. You have to look through the image and all of a sudden the beautiful scene will arrive. And the same is true for your revenue targets. Yes, have the re revenue targets there on your poster, so to speak, but you gotta look past them. You have to look through them. They're not the reason, they're not the intention. They are guideposts and they are targets but if they're if they are your intention, you'll be disempowered in the conversation, in the negotiation, in the sale. Look past the poster, look past those targets, and look at your customer, who is the beautiful picture. Look at your customer and ask, you know, what's his pain? What's the problem that's causing that pain? Is there a solution I know of that can help them solve that pain? No, I love that. I, I totally love that. Because again, I get pitched in the DM. And I do reach out to people in DM, so don't hear what I'm not saying. You can reach out the right way. But I get pitched so many times, and it's always so transactional. But when you go, like you said, with a heart center approach to solve a problem for them, to see if you can help them out, to make their business, their life, their marriage, whatever it is you're doing better, it's fine. And it's okay to get paid for that stuff because it's a skill set that you can shrink time with them. That's what I'm hearing yeah. you say. Yeah, and you want to know the result of all of this, of everything that I've taught you. The result is you don't have to chase after customers. When you show up to your business in this way, they come chasing after you. Joe, I've been really fortunate to be featured on the Ellen DeGeneres show, the Rachel Ray show, the Today show, um, all kinds of like Fox and ABC news shows. I've been featured on the cover of Entrepreneur Magazine. And the thing that people are surprised to learn is that those opportunities came to me. They all came to me. They all came to me. And even my customers, they came to me. I generated over a million customers with $0 in ad revenue. Mm -hmm. They all came to me. Why? Because of the values that I'm teaching you and how I was living them in the world. And it becomes very attractive and magnetic to people. And when you are not needy and desperate of the world, when you're not needy and desperate of revenue number, numbers, when you're not needy and desperate of people seeing you because you created this awesome brand, which I was caught in, right? I shared yep. that story. When you're not needy and desperate of life and the world and your business, and you genuinely put goodness out into the world, they come to you and you're not chasing anybody. Yeah, and that's how it should be. That, that's the perfect dichotomy for lack of better terms that's the perfect way for it to happen because your customer likes knows and trusts you and you don't have to go after them because you already shine your light and doing what you need to do to draw them in so i love that where can people find you well i have a podcast it's called what's working now and it's on apple Podcasts, spotify anywhere that you listen to podcasts and i love interviewing fascinating entrepreneurs who I want to find the root of their success. And I'm looking for the principles that they are embodying mm -hmm. and really deconstructing that. So that's what I do on my show, What's Working Now. You can also find me on Instagram, katie.live. Um, go sign up for my newsletter. I send out a uh, once a week newsletter where I give value. I teach you an, a new principle and help you to live this life where you can be extremely successful in business and in life. I love that. So I have two last questions. I don't always ask these, but this one, because I like how your mind works. It's a little bit challenging, but I think you'll like it. So you can go back in time as far as you want, or you can go forward in time as far as you want. You get to stay for one year with me, anyone you want in the span of history. Doesn't matter who it is. You get to go there for one year. Then you get to bring that knowledge back to today. Where would you go and what would you learn? Um, maybe this sounds cliche. I was actually reading in the New Testament today. Uh, it's, it's actually not what I'm actively reading right now, but I was searching up light and I was looking at scriptures that talk about light and it led me to the life of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. in the New Testament. And he's such a fascinating man. 
like you and I are talking about business and sales, like who's the greatest example of service and, and therefore sales it's Jesus Christ yeah. and his, his ability to teach and serve people at a really high level. It's, it's just continually fascinating. So this might sound cliche, but I would love to be a fly on the wall and go watch and observe him and learn from him, not just through somebody else's account, mm -hmm. but to like firsthand see that. Yeah, no, that's not cliche because I can see it all over your face. It's genuine and real. So no, that, that, that's, that's amazing. I love that. Oh, the other question I was going to say is what parting words of wisdom have we not talked about that you might want to give to the audience? Anything else that we missed? Anything that's on your heart? Sure. Um, you know, being an entrepreneur and a business owner is like the hardest thing you can do. And there were a lot of dark days on my journey. I still have them. I do. Thankfully, I have the tools to navigate them when they show up. But like I look back on my own journey and there were some points where I could have lost it all, right? Mm -hmm. And in those moments, I was so full of doubt and I didn't know how to move forward. And for me, I can see the people who were in my life at those critical moments who, when I was full of doubt, they believed in me. And I was able to lean on them in that moment of doubt. And so for you who's listening right now, I want you to know that if you're in those dark moments that this woman right here, Katie Richardson, mother of four, entrepreneur, high performance coach, living in Puerto Rico, I believe in you. And in that moment of doubt, I want you to lean on me and my faith and my belief in you and know that you can do it. You got this. I love that. Thank you so much for being on here, Katie. We've talked about a bunch of really cool stuff and I appreciate you being on the show. Thank you, Joe. It yeah. really has been an honor. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Awesome. And for all of you listening, thank you for listening to the 150K podcast where we help take your dreams to six figures and beyond. Do me a favor, find five people that need to hear this episode and just share it with them because people need to hear Katie's voice, her message and what she brings to the world. And until next time, Know you're loved, know you're whole, and you're perfect how you are. Just keep getting better. Have a great 